Welcome to another round of Prem and Proper here on SGH. We'll take you through the activity in the first division in England and get you ready for a very, very busy weekend. We've already had the one match happen for Friday night football. We'll go over that in just a little bit. But let's go backward as we always do before we go forward. And here's what happened before we got into this particular match week. Last time out on the board, it was all the way back at the beginning. After the, It was the tail end of the uh, three matches in seven or eight days, depending on how you wrapped up. Liverpool, a 2-1 winner at Selhurst Park over Crystal Palace. They were at a minus 200. Wolves and Nottingham Forest had a 1-1 draw to plus 242. Sheffield United, big win at Bramall Lane against Brentford at a plus 368, 1-0. Bournemouth, shocking Manchester United, continuing the uh, – Concerns over Eric Ten Hag, and those are the words that we'll use, at a plus 379. Brighton and um, Burnley had a 1-1 draw at a plus 353. Villa over Arsenal 1-0 at a plus 265. Manchester City down 1-0 to Luton Town, came back to win on Sunday by the final of 2-1. Fulham put five on West Ham at a plus 123, winning 5-0. Everton beat Chelsea 2-0, and we will catch up on the situation with Everton and where they're going to play a little later on in the show. Plus 156 for Everton winning at Goodison Park. And then Spurs put four on a very, very dinged-up Newcastle side. 4-1 your final there at a plus 108. And the first match on Friday Night Football, Spurs over uh, Nottingham Forest for this weekend at a minus 149. That final was 2-0. So that sets us up for the standings. Once again, reminder, Spurs and Forest have played one more match than everybody else. They are already into match 17. Liverpool at 36 points, a point ahead of Arsenal at 36. Villa's at 35. Manchester City's at 33, ahead of Spurs on goal difference. Remember, all of the first four have a match in hand on Tottenham. That's group number one. Group number two, Manchester United, 27 points. They've lost two of three. Newcastle has lost two in a row. They're at 26, ahead of Brighton on goal difference. West Ham is ninth at 24. Fulham's at 21. They've won three of four. Brentford now begins the bottom half of the table at 19 points ahead of Chelsea on goal difference by only one goal, plus one to even as Chelsea has scored and allowed 26. Wolves are five goals back of Chelsea to be in 13th. Bournemouth are four goals behind Wolves, so that is why the four teams at 19 points are in that order, 11, 12, 13, and 14. Crystal Palace, 16 points in 16 matches. They have lost 4 of 5, but they only have one point in their last five matches with a record of 4, 4, and 8 heading into the weekend. Nottingham Forest is at 3, 5, and 9, 14 points. They've lost 4 of 5, one point in their last five matches. Everton out of the relegation zone. They've won three in a row, 4 of 5. They are at 13 points. They would be at 23 were it not for the Federation's decision on docking them the 10 points for violating FFP. The three teams currently in the relegation zone, pretty much the three that we kind of figured it was going to be, Luton, Burnley, and Sheffield United. Luton Town lost three in a row. They're at nine points. Uh, Burnley is at 2-2-12. Two, two, and 12. They are at eight. They've hit each column once in their last three. Sheffield United won the last time out to draw closer to the pack. They're at eight points at 2-2-12. Two, two, and 12. They are 11 goals behind Burnley right now when it comes to goal difference. We'll hear from uh, Maddie Cruz coming up a little later on as she cruises through the Prem from her Newcastle lens, and she'll get you ready for the weekend, but let's get you into the sound of the preparations here. And the, the first two come from the post-match after Spurs beat Forrest 2-0. First on, and they both have to do with Nottingham Forest. Kelly Cates, Jamie Carricker, Gary Neville discuss Nottingham Forest's current situation. Are they staying? Or are they going? Here's their analysis, courtesy of our friends at Sky Sports. Jamie, should Nottingham Forest be seriously concerned about relegation? Or can you see that they can turn a corner as they did after a similar run last season? Oh, they'd be concerned, of course they will. You, you know, th those teams near the bottom now have almost started coming into a little bit of form, picking points up. It took them so long to get off the mark. 
you know, Chris Wilder's come in now, plays really well against Liverpool, unfortunate maybe to not get a point out of that game, then wins the next game. Burnley obviously won a big game against Sheffield United. Luton are making it difficult. I mean, Luton at home are playing some of the best teams in the country and only losing by the odd goal, being in games. And, and Bournemouth have just been on a great run. So, yes, there'll be huge concern. And that's the reason why, obviously, every time we do a Nottingham Forest game at the moment, people are talking about, you know, the manager's job because, you know, they're, they're on sort of... You know, you look at the slide there. I mean, the real killer one for me, and I felt it at the time because, as I said before the game, you know, the relationship between the manager and owner is probably not perfect. But when they, I think they were two 0 up against Luton, and when that finished two two, you think, oh, that's a bad one. You know, to almost think they have got the game over the line. You're losing to a team who's just been promoted, so that was a bad one. But listen, that has to improve very quickly. Uh, can we just put that slide back up? Because I think we should. Uh, uh, I don't have a button to press, but I'm sure no, someone. Because I think can. that if you look, if you look at that as a one in thirteen, I'd look at it slightly differently. If you look at that top uh, set of results there, that's not too bad. You've got four draws and a victory up until that green there against Aston Villa. That isn't too bad. That would be sort of wouldn't be seen as bad. Oh, what's really bad is the last six. That's the real problem where you've got one point out of the last six matches. I know we're putting it into one mm. in 13, but that top six or seven results, that could be any sort of period in the season for a team down there fighting for points and they're getting things out of games. It's a struggle to win a game in the Premier League and they beat Villa. That's fine. It's the bottom ones. It's the run that they're in now in these last six games, which is more worrying. It's whether it, that, you know, it's a deterioration, really. And then on the other side of that, what about Steve Cooper's... Uh, uh, hold on the players, how they feel on him as a coach, and how the fans feel about having Steve Cooper as the man in charge once again from that same post-game show on Friday Night Football on Sky Sports. A word on, on Morgan Gibbs-White and, and his comments there, and the words that we've, we've heard from, from other players within the Forest team about the support that they, they have for, for Steve Cooper. And they're going beyond the kind of usual pat phrases that we hear from, from players when they say... It's all about you know. It's all about players. We've got to do our bit. There seems to be a genuine affection and respect for Steve Cooper. Well, certainly from Morgan Gibbs White, there was a relationship going back a few years in the England youth teams. They had success together. I think that was one of the big reasons why he came here, because who the manager was, because there was other uh, teams in for him when he was at Wolves. But also, I think a lot of that goes back to also the crowd. Now, those players, as you said, would say that about any manager. But so players would not be like to be seen as the player who was maybe against the manager or you know causing a problem because the supporters might turn on them because there's such a strong feeling here and you don't see it with many football clubs you know you think of probably Liverpool with Klopp and Pep Guardiola at Man City there's very few football clubs who, uh, managers who feel like they've got the supporters in the palm of the hand and he has you know and it, it, it has been a big thing for him and I think at times last season it kept him in a job and right now the scenes at uh, Wolves last week a few days after you know the debacle at, at Fulham I think, uh, you know, he's really appreciative of uh, the manager, but I think that's uh, at times when they're on a bad run, it's definitely keeping him in a job. You know Steve Cooper quite well, obviously, from a from long time ago. What would he be like in this type of period? Would he be a manager that would go in there and start to sort of not lose his rag with the players, but would he be strong with them, or do you think he'd just continue to keep pushing forward his coaching principles? Yeah, he, he, he's a coach. He, he comes through sort of Liverpool's academy. The, the, the Barcelona model, who was running Liverpool's academy at the time, was sort of a big influence on him. He's gone to England, so he's had great experience. But you just got to think from a, from a footballing point of view, how many players have come in. You talk about the cost, but different players from all over the world, different sort of cultures, and how he's tried to almost manage that. And what you got to remember is they're all proper players. A lot. It's not like they brought like kids in and you can say, OK, we'll dip them in and out. The players coming to the club for big fees, we're probably expecting to play. So just to manage that situation is certainly not easy. So there's a lot on his plate, but of course, you know, when you're a Premier League manager, if you're on a run of one win in 12, there's going to be talk of your job, and that's for any manager at any club. Here's your injury report as we know it from uh, Friday afternoon, East Coast time, the ins and the outs for Match Week 17, courtesy of our friends at Sky Sports News. Let's now run you through the rest of the weekend's team news, starting off with Bournemouth against Luton at the Vitality. No new injury worries for Andoni Iraiola. For Luton, Gabriel Osho, Chidozic, and Bene will be available. Issa Kabore also returns after being ineligible to face his parent club, Manchester City. Marvel Sakamba is suspended. To Stamford Bridge, Chelsea will be without Robert Sanchez, Mark Kukurea and Rhys James for the set of Sheffield United. Goalkeeper Georgia Petrovic and forward Christopher Nkunku could make their debuts. For United, Ollie's McBurney and Norwood are both back from suspension. The field of Ben Osborne is also available. To the Etihad, to the champions, Manchester City, Erling Haaland expected to miss tomorrow's game against Crystal Palace. 
Plenty of injury problems, meanwhile, for Roy Hodgson. But Tyrant Mitchell is back and available. Dean Henderson and Eberechi Eze trained, but this match probably comes too soon for them. Jordan Ayew is suspended. From there to the northeast, Kieran Trippier will miss a Premier League match for the first time this season. He's suspended. And Newcastle will also assess Anthony Gordon's hamstring injury from Wednesday's defeat to AC Milan. Fulham's Willian and Issa Job are both fit, but Adama Torre and Tim Ream are out. Two turf more, and Burnley's Aaron Ramsey could be set for a spell on the sidelines after being forced off against Brighton. Everton will be without Driscoll Garnagay and Jared Brantwaite due to suspension. Fullbacks Ashley Young and Seamus Coleman are both out. Down to the Emirates we go. Gabriel Martinelli returns to the Arsenal squad for the visit of Brighton after overcoming a brief illness. Roberto De Zerbi will be hoping that Evan Ferguson continues to improve his fitness to earn a place in the starting eleven. Uh, to West London and Brian and Bomo is set for 12 weeks out after he undergoes ankle surgery. But Brentford will have Nathan Collins back for the game with Aston Villa, who have doubts over Yuri Tillemans and Leon Bailey. Douglas Luiz and Luca Dean are suspended. From West London to East in the first part of Super Sunday, Edson Alvarez being assessed for West Ham after picking up a knock in last night's Europa League win over Freiburg, although not thought to be too serious. The Wolves' Ryan Outnuri could be back. And finally, the huge game at Anfield, second part of Super Sunday. Liverpool boss Jurgen Klopp has no fresh injury concerns. As for Manchester United, Marcus Rashford and Luke Shaw are available, but Harry Maguire and Anthony Martial are out. And remember that their captain, Bruno Fernandes, is suspended. Whew, right then. Lots to look forward to this weekend. We've got you covered on Soccer Saturday and also a jam-packed Soccer Sunday. Then getting into the discussion about Aston Villa once again. Two points away from the top spot, 11-2-3. Right now they are in third. Someone asked Unai Emery about uh, the idea of already being in a position to win the Premier League. Unai Emery uh, said way too early, courtesy of Villa, their own selves. Third in the table. By the sounds of it, therefore, could they not be pushing even further? You know, in the media we'll get excited about a title race potentially. Are you at all thinking like that? Not. I will speak about it when we are facing the the day 30, 32, and in case we will be there, maybe I can put or set this objective in my mind with the player, with the club, with everybody. But now we are third. It's amazing. And we are there because we are deserving it. But it's still being very, very difficult. And the next challenge is on Sunday in Brentford. Very difficult match. And against teams like Brentford, more or less, uh, we are having more problems to, to get a good performance and to face then imposing our game plan. Why? Because his Premier League is very difficult. Borja Hampton is really very difficult. Uh, Nottingham Forest is really very difficult. Um, Bournemouth is really very difficult. Tomorrow is really very difficult. Good news for Chelsea. Mauricio Pochettino at his uh, pre-weekend press opportunity got to discuss the fate of Christopher Nkunku. Here's what he had to say, courtesy of Chelsea, their own selves. A little bit of good news. What can you tell them about Christopher and Konku? Can he be involved in the squad? Yes, can be involved. Uh, that is uh, is very good news because I seem to be involved uh, tomorrow and be in the squad and start also to to feel to feel the competition and to feel the Premier League and be with the team main. I seen after. Uh, the precision is, is a very good news for us, but what we need to now to be calm and quiet because it's not uh, it's going to put all the pressure on him. Uh, now he need to evolve, uh, know the the Premier League, know the competition, and of course, but it's but the way I see is a big uh, you know motivation also for for us, for the teammate and for the for our fans to see. Um, a player that should be important for us, uh, be back on the on the squad, or be on the squad for first time on the season. Manchester United, as we mentioned, always at the, right now they're at the top of group number two. Nine wins, seven losses. That's it. No draws. It's either one extreme or the other. They've won three of five, but they've lost two of three. So, what about Eric Ten Hag and his level of confidence heading into the weekend, especially with what happened last time out when Manchester United played their upcoming opponent, Liverpool. I, I haven't seen last season that we were scared there. And, yeah, well, it, it, we lost the 7-0, right? So that's uh, happened. So uh, now that's happened. Yeah, Do you think? Yeah, but it, that is, um, it was a bad experience, <laughs> but um, it's, it's not similar. 
and it's, uh, you start again on, on no. And uh, last year, first half, I think we played very decent, and we got hammered just before half time, just before, uh, just after half time, and, and then we collapsed. So yeah, that can't happen. But it was last year, and it was a different team, also all, uh, different players, uh, for part at least. Yeah, so yeah, we, we will not ignore it, but uh, we, we go there. And we will be confident, and I know my players. They will be confident to uh, to go there from the end, or from the start uh, to the end. Uh, we have to fight there. We have to challenge there, and, yeah, and you go there with the idea. Uh, and so we will prepare them, and we go to win there. Have you watched it back? Will you show it to them? Have you shown it to them to sort of point out what you, <coughs> not to learn from it, basically? No. <laughs> so we know that, but. I don't think it's uh, the right thing. Uh, and last year, it was last year, it was the past. And what we can change is the future. And so that's Sunday. Sunday is, is a new game. Mentioned that update on Everton and the construction at Bramley Moore Dock and playing at Goodison Park. Here's the update once again, courtesy of our friends at Sky Sports News. Let's bring you a breaking story from Everton. And it's a positive one this time, Everton fans, because the club have confirmed that the men's senior team will play competitive fixtures at its new stadium at the start of the 2025-26 season. So that's not next season, that's the season after, because next season, 24-25 campaign, will be Everton's last playing their men's senior fixtures at Goodison Park. They discussed this decision with the club's fan advisory board at their latest meeting and interim CEO and Chief Stadium Development Officer Colin Chong confirmed that in a blog that was released today. Um, so in terms of their new stadium, it's uh, 52,888 capacity at Bramley Moor Dock. Construction remains on schedule. Work is set to be completed late next year. And Chung also said the move would allow for Goodison Everton's home since 1892 to be given a fitting send-off. So the men's senior team, so Sean Dyche's team, to play competitive games at the new stadium, Bramley Moor Dock, the season after next, the start of the 2025-26 campaign. And the last piece of sound is a lot of folks catching up with managers around the Premier League. Very, very cool uh, events happening this weekend. Rebecca Welch is going to be the first time that uh, a female is going to be center ref. And then Sam Allison will be uh, a part of an officiating crew. And that is very, very cool to have the, the Afro-European a representation when it comes to the Premier League. So here's what the, the managers said about Welch and Allison being a part of the cruise this weekend for the PGMOL. I think it's a great news. Um, with Rebecca all the best in this new experience, um, I think the feedback is going to be really positive. I think what women's football is on and, and the diversity that we have now um, is incredibly positive for the league and I think it's um, something that was needed. I think it's a great moment. I think for me... It's got to be based on ability, not gender. Um, ability to referee, and I fully support it. Excellent idea. More yeah. than welcome. Hopefully in the future can be more. I am really happy because i seen in France when we were in Paris Saint-Germain, already in France, Stephanie uh, is a referee, a female ref referee, and she was really, really good. And why not? I think the, the capacity is there. If the capacity is there, and I seem, uh, I seem so happy. Well, I think it's positive, and I think football has certainly embraced um, women and ethnicity an awful lot better over even the last just the last couple of seasons. We've seen enormous strides forward, and I I welcome those strides. I applaud people for bringing those strides about, and um, I'm certain that everyone has to be a trailblazer. Let's hope that the lady in question will be a trailblazer, but. There's no doubt that I'm sure she will have every bit as much competence as the other people she's competing with and it will be up to the people who judge referee in performances to decide how far her career goes. I think it's brilliant, uh, probably too late, uh, not too late, but uh, how can I say it sounds uh, not in the right way. Uh, I would have loved that to see that earlier, but uh, it's better... Uh, better late than never, uh, and I really, I, I, I definitely support it. We support it. Um, I think it's, um, it's fantastic. It's fantastic. Really, really good to see. 
Sam, I know a little bit because he's refed some of our games at Forest Green before as well. So it's brilliant. His journey's actually been similar to mine over the last couple of years. You know, he, um, League Two, League One, bumped up to the Championship quite quickly. Now getting the opportunity in the Premier League, so that's great. Um, but for both of those individuals, yeah, fantastic. And um, you know, we need, we need to see more of it. Uh, in Germany, years years ago, it was not the Champions League in Bundesliga. It was a referee, so or for official or close there. So everybody's involved, more involved. So. It's good. All right, let's get you into matchups and juice boxes before we go. Wait a second. I just remembered something. We got to get you ready for the weekend. And so here's uh, Maddie cruising through the weekend through the Newcastle Prism. Maddie, take it away. Hey, everyone. It's Maddie again talking about Newcastle. Um, listen, I said it. I said it on Monday, and I'm going to say it again. I, I knew we weren't going to pull it through. But what they had to do was just give me a little bit of hope. Like, they gave me some hope where I could be like, wow, you know what? We could do this. And then no. And then then they just decided to not do that for me. So um, not really much to say. Um, Joe Ellington's goal in the 33rd minute was absolutely stunning. I mean, what a goal that was. I, I, I was I, – that goal happened and we had so – we. oh, my gosh. I just – I can't even speak. I can't even speak. We, we, this was like the first game where I thought we actually like looked a, a little bit more put together than we have been in the past two games where we lost. Like I, I, I felt like we actually played well. And then obviously just that late goal by AC Milan to put them ahead. I mean, it, yeah, it, it is what it is. I think both sides played really well. Seeing as I kind of root for both sides, I was like, it didn't really matter to me who one necessarily but it kind of sucks the way that we finished um out in the champions league you know this is how we exited it just it's kind of been like you know how we've been playing the entire champions league i mean after i saw that first couple games i just i i, I knew we weren't getting out of the group stages i knew that wouldn't happen it just sucks that you know we went out in this way and i mean eddie howe said that you know newcastle's absolutely devastated um, to have been crashed out of the Champions League, and I, yeah, I mean, everyone's devastated. I think, I think everyone expected them to do a lot better than they did, and they didn't capitalize on that. Especially after the the success of last season, coming into now, you know, to have that run in the Champions League to get knocked out that early on, it just it kind of it, it makes you question it. And obviously like we have injuries and stuff, but I just don't think that's an excuse anymore. You know, obviously it's definitely a hindrance, but I don't think you can place all the blame on that. So I, I don't know. I mean, um, one thing I do want to leave off before we get into kind of the overview of what we can expect this weekend for Newcastle. Um, I'll leave it with this quote um, from Eddie Howe. Um, I thought there were some good bits. We were dominant at times, but probably needed the second goal. And we definitely, didn't defend the two goals well enough, which I completely agree. Um, I completely agree. I think I think they, they played a very good game. There were moments that I saw, like, good, and then there were moments where I was like, you know, they didn't defend well enough. Like, you know, it's always those moments where you need – yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know. I just – we could have played so much better. But anyway, enough with my rant about the Champions League and how well we did or didn't do. Let's move on to Premier League Week 17. Newcastle United will be facing off against Fulham tomorrow, which is Saturday, um, December 16th at 10 a.m. I, I, I don't know. I, th I think we're expected to do well, but will we do well? I honestly don't know. I do, I do not know. Um, Fulham's coming off of... Two back-to-back -back wins. Um, they faced off against West Ham United last week where they won 5-0. And then they also played Nottingham Forest about two weeks ago. Is that is my math correct? I don't know. But they faced off against um, Nottingham Forest um, and they won also 5-0. So I really don't know how this game is going to shape out. We definitely have to come out strong. We have to perform well. And if we don't do that, we might lose this game. And that's not... We, we can't afford to do that. But Newcastle's ranked fourth in goals scored per match. They have kept the most clean sheets in competition. And Newcastle also hasn't lost to Fulham in their last six meetings. It has been four wins and two draws. So 
we shall see. Um, that's enough for me, though, about my rant on Newcastle. Um, but, yeah, um, I'll see you guys Monday for the prim and proper review. Now let's get you ready. Now that Maddie has gotten rid of the, the loss from last week, she's ready for the weekend. So are we. So here's the juice boxes and the next matches on the board here in uh, match week 17. 10 o'clock starts on Saturday morning. Big matchup at the bottom in the bottom third of the table at the Vitality. It is Bournemouth, the minus 213, hosting Luton Town, who's a plus 600. Chelsea hosting Sheffield United, and they are a minus 400 at Stamford Bridge. Sheffield United to win north of plus 1130 in the composite courtesy of our friends at Odds Portal. Uh, Manchester City, once again, not anticipating because of the Club World Cup coming up in the midweek that Erling Holland will be a part of the discussion against Crystal Palace, but they're still at a minus 500. Newcastle favored at St. James uh, against Fulham at a minus 112. Burnley and Everton is your 12.30 Eastern time game. Burnley's a plus 261. Everton on the road at Turf Moor is a plus 112. On Sunday, it is four matchups. Three of them at 9 o'clock. Arsenal and Brighton, probably one of the big ones that is there. Uh, minus 204, Arsenal favored. Brighton is a plus 550. Brentford hosting Aston Villa at a plus 217. Villa on the road a plus 123. West Ham and Wolves. West Ham at home a plus 114. Draw against Wolves is a plus 263. Wolves are a plus 245. 11.30, it is Liverpool and Manchester United. The big matchup on the weekend, Liverpool. At home is a minus 303. Manchester United to win on the road at plus 759 in the composite. And your draw option is a plus 515. So that gets you ready for uh, all of the activity that is going on in the Premier League here in Match Week 17. Once again, as always, thanks to Maddie, thanks to the teams, and thanks to all the networks that to help us out in getting you ready for the action that is going on in the Prem. So for everybody here at SDH, that's Prem and Proper for Match Week 17. Play it safe, everybody. Don't forget, update on Prem and Proper, the review on SDH, and that will be on uh, the at 1030 Eastern time on your Monday. That's the word that is, comes up after Sunday. So the Monday show, 1030, after the visit from uh, Bart Keeler and uh, Soccer for US POD will close out the show breaking down everything in the Premier League starting 10.30 Monday morning on Prem and Proper, the review. So for everybody here at SDH, I'm just John. Thanks for hanging out with us for another round of Prem and Proper. Enjoy Match Week 17. Play it safe, everybody. We'll see you next time.